What's up, Kingdom of Rock? This is Matt Gibson, and we're here today with another exciting episode during the COVID crisis. But hey, we've uh, Mike, Melinda, what's up? Oh, I saw you pointing there, man. Oh, I forgot. We have this, our guest. <laughs> yes, we have our we have our guests. We have Pat Vegas, Frankie Vegas, PJ Vegas, Redbone, and well, I guess your own acts as well, your own projects. And uh, we're, we're really excited to have you guys here. You know, it's it's weird, this digital stuff, um, being able to connect this way is is, is really a great innovation in technology. And, uh, you know, we get a chance to, to have these great conversations with, with a successful, uh, amazing artists, you know, and uh, it's just a blessing. But sometimes the technology, I just, uh, switched your windows around it's a new feature and it totally caught me off guard i'm not used to having the guest there in that position <laughs> but it's um so anyway <laughs> yeah thanks i'm for always apologizing for my intros michael why do i why do i do that yeah, you're looking good bro yeah don't don't um, give away the secrets of uh oopsing no oopsing. all right well pat vegas welcome to the show how's it going brother so much. thank you so much Thank you, Pat. So, so if if Kingdom of Rock, if you don't know who Pat Vegas is, Pat is uh, one of, I guess, the legendary bass player of the band Redbone. Been with them, one of the founders of the band. And uh, if if you don't know who Redbone is for some reason, I know you know the song "Come and Get Your Love" on the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack, and you know that's everyone knows that song, right? Mm -hmm. So, Pat, that's. Did you write that song, Pat? Yes, What's I wrote it with my brother. Dude, tell what why don't we just start off? Because that's the big elephant in the room, is that that song is so huge, right? Uh, like when uh, when you when you wrote that song with your brother, like what did you obviously you didn't have a, a clue that it was gonna be that big, but what did you what was the what was the vibe during that time when you guys were writing that? He called me up at he, Lolly called me up at Three in the morning, three thirty in the morning. Said, so "You got to come over here and help me write this song." He had he had a completely different uh, perspective of what it, what it turned out to be. It, it was real sing song, you know, this kind of little ballad. It was slower, so, yeah. yeah, slower like a ballad. But I put it, I put a tempo on it, and I put that bass, put, uh, put bass, uh, put, uh, you know, patterns. Yeah, the main there, line. That, that set it up and kept it together, you know. And uh, and uh, and it did came out with magical, you know. We just spent the whole night, you know. So you you came up with a boom, 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 boom. That's your part, or yes, the entire baseline, that which is a which yeah. is a, a, a continuous pattern. And I, I didn't realize because uh, I think I, I wrote an email back. I mean, you know, I I was voraciously watching like Midnight Special and Don Curse with Rock concert back when I was a kid, and yeah. you know, Redbone came out. Uh, on Midnight Special in '74, and and uh, you know you did the the dance beforehand. I mean, first off, I'm just a kid. You know, I'm going like, what the hell is going on? And then and then that song hit, and then I didn't realize, despite the fact that you know that was a, a brilliant thing for Native American rock acts because you hit the top five of the Billboard 100. But you know, your brother Lolly with that um, uh, you know the Leslie effect on his guitar. Big yeah. deal. Your baseline, big deal. And I just found out today, because um, I've been doing some work on drummers, and I didn't realize that Pete DePoe invented the whole King Kong beat. I'm going through videos, I'm like, there's tens of thousands of video views of people teaching other people Pete, yeah. and even David Garibaldi, the super yeah. master yeah. 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 Power, he says that was the beat that changed his life. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, 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 Peter. Peter is, is an amazing musician. He's an incredible drummer. He's got his he's got his Cheyenne background, you know, with the Indian beats in that time, and that was part of the influence. And then when he heard Lale and I playing the the, the way we play together, we were born together, you know, uh, he he tightened up his uh, entire uh, uh, routine and chops and stuff, and that that's what came out of it. Was that kind of how you put the, was it mostly everybody working together like gears, you know, everybody in the band, including, of course, you know, Tony Bellamy is no longer with us. Yeah. 
no longer with us, but um, would would you guys work together and or did somebody take the lead and go, no, I want you to do this, but I want you to do that? Well, I, I did mostly that. Okay. Anyway, but the thing was that each part, the way it lays in there in the rhythm is it's, it, it, it's not in each other's way. It's like almost a built-in separation you know, map in sound because it's, it's, the independence is incredible. And, and, and because it's, it's so fast, it's so, so uh, turning in so many different directions, we could turn the beat around and turn it upside down and do all that and come back on the one. <laughs> you know, you know. Well, another amazing thing is I just realized that just to show the enduring you know, legacy of Come and Get Your Love is on August 3rd, this month, you just put out a new video for the song and it already has over half a million views on YouTube. Super yeah. incredible. Congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, that's, 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 I see recording, uh, Sony Music, um, yeah. everyone over there that uh, thought that idea, we actually got approached by Legacy Recordings and let us know that they were putting together music videos for people who had songs that had really kind of like changed the game and that were before the time of like a music video type deal. So um, they put that together. They use native um, uh, artwork, artwork yeah. but uh, they use native directors, native um, graphic designers and everyone that created that project, everyone that was involved in the creation was native. So that was the great part about it. It was a story told by natives for natives. And uh, yeah, it's, yeah. Doing, it's doing great. Man. So, so, doing really so well. CBS did a great job for us. I mean, they're still doing a great Ooh. job. CBS, Sony. I mean, Sony. Sony. <laughs> yeah, so and it's, it follows the story of a Native American man searching for his true love mm -hmm. in the universe. So, the whole you know time throughout the video, it's him walking uh -huh. through all these different parallel universes and times and. You know, it's, it's it's pretty awesome. And I find myself in a flying saucer, you know, out in space, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I turn my whole head around. So mm -hmm. now I know why I've got to. I've got to come from there, you know. We well, you know, now that they've uh, released all the secret Area Fifty One stuff, maybe we will get pulled up in a flying saucer soon. Who knows? That's right. That's right. You just it. just casually released it. You know, no big right deal. Yeah. <laughs> no big media coverage. Just be here. Right everything you guys have been questioning all these years yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? well, how you know i we kind of look at at the 70s as kind of you know 50s rock grows up 60s it starts making money 70s it really starts making money yeah. the, the industry as a whole but i mean was it difficult for you and your brother and the band, you know, to kind of negotiate the business as native americans or did they the business just look at you as like Hey, they've got good songs they're in. Yeah, you know, we were lucky that we worked with people over at CBS, Larry Cohen and those guys like that. And it was in, in, in Clive Davis. So, so they liked us right away. I mean, uh, the minute they heard us and uh, and we were all standing there saying, okay, what's the name of the group? And I said, Redbone. I said, what does that mean? It means half Indian, half Native American and half anything else you know half breed half breed yeah and so so they loved it and and it wasn't that it wasn't it wasn't that big a, of a problem for us i mean they they liked the group right from the get-go and uh and uh, we signed right away because yeah. usually uh you know the interesting thing about, about redbone is you know you guys broke through when you were you know as as you should be unapologetically promoting your your culture, you know, where you could see another manager going, you know, whether you're, you know, whatever, you know, I, I don't know, maybe we should water that down a little bit. Kids not, might not buy the record or something, but, no, but it never affected you at all. No, no, no. we've been straight at you, you know. We, we, we said, <laughs> people said, yeah, but they'll be shooting at you from Dallas. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, I said, I then told Peter, let's go. And we went with the, the full dance, the regalia, the chants, because that, that's who we were, and that's what we wanted to represent. We didn't want uh, 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 the Western movies to represent us. Yeah. You know, we wanted to break away from that persona and- uh, and, and yeah, make make success and revolutionize things in, in their own culture, in their own name, you know? And, right. and why not stand for something that's really true, true to you and your heritage? So they really embodied that, and luckily everyone was on board, you know. 
Yeah. So it was great. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, I mean it's, it was a different time back then. It's awesome that it happened that way. And of course, what, you know, Matt and I and everybody who's been on this show from Steve Vai to Steve Stevens, Steve Lucifer, yeah. you know, it, it, everybody says you, you, you have to do what, what you love. Yeah. You have to be authentic and all that, which wasn't always authentic, but it's, it's such a beautiful story that, you know, you and your brother and the rest of the team was able to, be that, put it together, bring the world something awesome, and you know, and change so many people along. We just talked about the drumming thing, you know. Yeah. Your Redbone goes out through so many different threads that you won't even realize. Yeah, know? we called it the prehistoric rhythm with a King Kong beat. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> they had that prehistoric rhythm already going on, and then yeah. when uh, Pete picked up on it, he, he just laid that King Kong beat, and it was yeah, a wrap. That was it. It was over. Yeah, it's, it's it's craziness. Yeah, it's, it all it all like was very very synchronized. It happened all for a reason. You when you you can also see in the in the book as well that the, there is it tells about the story of all everyone kind of entering. I will get that. Yeah, yeah, entering the band and and it just happened so perfectly. Even Pete get, getting into the band. Yeah, that yeah. story of. Yeah. How he was uh, the drummer for he was, um, he was the drummer for Bobby Bob, Womack. Bobby Womack. And Bobby brought him in and said, "Hey, I got a drummer for you guys." Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and I and I I had I was I got had a different the, drummer. Yeah. And we had a different drummer, which Bobby Womack took the drummer we had. <laughs> they swapped drummers. They swapped his name, them. His name, was, his name was Wayne Bibby, and he was a great great drummer. But I, I was walking up to the house where we were rehearsing, and I heard. Lolly and Tommy chilling with you know and uh, with Pete and, and I didn't know it was Pete and then it was the other drummer and when I walked in and saw Pete I said that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well and Pete also allegedly played with uh Jimi Hendrix back in Seattle as well, right? Yes. Well yes. and uh, your band had a Hendrix connection, right? You and you yes. and Lolly did, right? We had, the, we had the club called the Experience in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. It was called the Experience. And uh, we would go in there and sit in and jam, and he'd get up there with us. And as a matter of fact, he, he told us that he wanted to join Redbone. And, and I, I really thought he was just saying that, but he, I heard that to the grapevine that he called the record company and told him uh, he was canceling his contract with one of us and going to join Redbone. <laughs> <laughs> so they told him, you do that, and you'll never work again. <laughs> wow. No. He talked well, to him about actually starting the Native yeah, American yeah. group. Like, cause he's part Native American as well. And I know, guys should do that. And, I, know, yeah. I met Jimmy's family, entire family in Seattle. So, you know, his brother and everybody else. It's a nice family. Did, now, speaking of the book, uh, Frankie and Pat uh, put together a book, right? And it's yeah. coming out October 27th. Is that right? So, yeah, I'm, I'm not... 100% on the date yet, um, but he he collaborated with um, a writer named Christian Stabler, who uh, originally was just a huge fan of Redbone and was head, head of the fan, fan club. club. And they, he had reached out to him and said, you know, I really want to depict your story in a graphic novel and, you know, can we collaborate on, on writing this? Yeah. So they started doing that and, and I jumped in and, and wrote the foreword for it and PJ and I are both depicted in it as well, like yeah. throughout the story and in the graphic form. It's, it's really amazing to see it and we're just really excited about it coming out with IDW Publishing. Yeah. Um, he was and, such a great time, yeah. such an awesome person, you know. And he did a great job to the book. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, now we're good friends with him. Yeah, yeah. He came down and we talked, and it was about a year or so in progress. And the illustrations from Seabolt, who is obviously the illustrator, and yeah. Sonia, who co wrote it with him, they did such an amazing job. Did you? Really showing, showcasing everything that they've been through and all the funny moments. and. And things like that. And it's, doing well too. Yeah, it, it released in France and it in uh I'd say not too long ago. Um but now the US version is coming out in English and in Spanish. So that should be out very I'm soon. Really proud of it, yeah. And oh. it's a it's a regular novel or a graphic novel? A graphic novel. So like a comic book kind of. Yeah, yeah. It, it, no, it, that's cool. It actually looks just like like a, like a hardcover regular book but when you open it up it has like a full-on story 
but then with graphic not graphic pictures kind of like a, kind of like a comic book but there is an actual storyline and a full story with like chapters and different yeah. and they're free floating which gives it a different element to usual comics who are boxed in yeah free, uh, free floating imagery which gives it like a really nice feel like throughout it's and it's very educational as well because they talk about american indian movement wounded knee um, you know, a lot of really important times in the Native American history uh, where we had to overcome a lot of different things. So it, it's educational and it's a really fun read. Yeah, there was a lot of obstacles in the beginning and we had to overcome so many things. It's just, and we played for, uh, for, for uh, concerts that were just incredible. We, did, we played for 250,000 people at the Washington Monument and we played for another 100 and something thousand in New Jersey. Philadelphia. Yeah, and then in Philadelphia for another hundred thousand. So, so we, we did some interesting concerts you know, and stuff. You know. What? Well, back, back in those days, when you start to have a hit like "Coming at Your Love," that's you know starting to scream up the charts. Uh, is that when the kind of screws get to the band and it's like, okay, you're going to be working 365 days a year? For, you know, I mean, what's it like to kind of have that success? I mean, how does it? Uh, 365 days. That's what he said. How many days? 365 days. Yeah. So you, you, there's no rest at all. You just had to work it, work it, work it. We'd be on stage sometimes with tears in our eyes. <laughs> we were so tired. The bodies hurt so bad. Really good. But we did it. We went through it. We did the set. We never changed. It was solid, but it was painful sometimes. Does, do your fingers get sore when you play that often? They bled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, my boots had blood splattered all over it. You know, so it was. It was. What is that? Uh, was there a, a, a resonance when a band plays that tightly together and that much? I mean, could you see the band start to develop into something almost psychic or? Uh, as a when you said the word resonance, you said it. It's like we, we all heard this certain tone in our heads and it, it, it just grabbed this boom. And we went in four different directions at, at times and, 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 and that, that held us together. And then we and at a certain point with a nod of the head, we'd all come right back on that one. And it was just amazing, amazing experience. That's, that, yeah. that's crazy. That's, it's a, a lot of work to get there though. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, they started off in surf music as Pat and Lolly Vegas. <laughs> That's the resident band on Shindig, which was a really big show in the 60s. Oh, yeah. yeah, I remember Shindig. Yeah, and they wore, you know, spiffy suits and <laughs> pompadours in their hair. And, and that was their first start as in the music industry. We toured with the Beach Boys back then. Mm -hmm. Ah, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, when did you and your brother decide that uh, you're going to flip from surf music into your own thing. We were working at Gazari's on the strip, you know, for, for uh, you know, you know, remember Gazari's? Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, and uh, we had been there for four and a half years. And one day we just was sitting there and we just looked at each other and said something's gotta change. So we decided that we were going to uh, lock ourselves up in some somehow somewhere and just Go for, go for our roots, you know. We wanted to express our roots, which is Native American. And uh, and then Pete came into the group. Pete said uh, he moved it. On the, he found out where I lived on, on Carlton Way. And he said that when he found out where I lived, he said he flew in from Seattle, rented a room two houses down from me. Mm -hmm. And when he heard Lolly and I playing at the, house, at the haunted house, he said he's got so scared he went back to Seattle. <laughs> yeah. And came back for five, That's four funny. years later and joined us. But he said he had to go home and, and woodshed, you know. So, so, so there, there probably weren't any parties or anything during that time. It was all business, right? All business. Yeah. A lot of parties. <laughs> I'm, I'm also interested uh, when you and Lolly decided to, to do your own thing and bring your roots up. As a basis, what did you draw your influences from? Were they the typical rock basis of the time, or did you go deeper into your culture and pull things from everywhere? That's exactly what I did. You're absolutely right. I, I went back and listened and studied a lot of the Tom, the, the drum beats, 
Mm-hmm. Drum beat. So my bass lines are, are rooted in drum, in the hand drum, you know, the native drum. And and I you know how we used to send messages. That's a through through the beat of the drum used to uh, communicate. Mm-hmm. So I, I studied that and figured that, and so I started uh, doing it with my bass. You know, mm-hmm. playing different notes that that reached out. You know, like when the, they were communicating with the drum over hundreds of miles. You know, whatever they were. You know, and smoke signals, you know, so I was always thinking about that. that that's really cool. It's like a, it's, it's, it's like a different approach to transmitting music yes. because your, your, your intent is different than your average person. They're not just like, okay, I got to play a C here, quarter notes. Mm-hmm. You know, you are trying to vibe with something in your culture as you're projecting out. I think that's a great, a great way to, to maintain creativity. Yes, you're right. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's you put a in collaboration with your ancestors. That's yeah. yeah. Well, it's also uh, yeah, it's cool, yeah. go of your uh, fear in a way, because a typical basis would go, well, I got to follow the harmony or I got to follow the kick drum. Yeah. And you went, I'm throwing that all out. I'm following my ancestors. These guys are going to have to follow me. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that's what gave it that little extra magic it needed, you know, to make it to the top. Especially for being so different than what you would normally see out yeah. and about, like in the music industry. Yeah, very native, for sure. Very well, native. when you and your brother, I know you've accompanied your dad on some Redbone dates or some dates playing Redbone music. How do you guys interpret that coming as you know the younger generation and all the stuff that you've put together in your own music careers? You're interpreting, you know, Redbone's music. Are there any things that you change or uh, amend or how does that go? Well, for me, um, going to his concerts growing up, I, I would see the energy in the air. You know, I'm very energetic. I'm, I'm empathetic type of person. Mm-hmm. So I'd see the energy in the air and, and within the music. And I, I'd see that no matter what age you were or where you came from, you were always moving. It always, you know, brought out a feeling inside of you that got you going. And that to me was the most powerful thing because it doesn't matter like the heritage or, you know, what style, if it feels good to the soul, people are going to move to it. So that to me influenced me in whatever I create, because I, I know that if I were to be like them and stay true to myself and what I believe in, what I feel like will help other people, they'll gravitate towards that because there's, you're genuine. You know, and that's what I got from it, for me at least. But um, I'll let PJ tell you what he got from it. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's uh, just being uh, true to yourself and just having a uh, someone that you can look up to that actually represents who you are as a person. There's so many people in this world that can look at someone on a stage or look at someone on a TV and be like, that guy, if that guy can do it, I can do it. But there's very few people that look like, us that are doing stuff that are breaking down the walls and to be able to have the representation it just kind of broke down all the barriers from a young age for me of thinking that like oh no natives can't make it big in music or no we can't we can't you know change the world with it you know like we can't we can't you know like instead of having that attitude it automatically broke down those barriers from a young age and gave me an outlook of like anything's possible you know, I mean, you know, to, you know. <laughs> to that point, though, PJ, it is kind of interesting where there's a lull. You have Redbone, you have Blackfoot, you have a couple of the 70s bands that are out there, the Native American bands. And then it kind of goes blank for quite a while until Indigenous or, you know, some of these, you know, uh, I think Keith Souls is another one, some of these other bands. So the government was actually oppressing a lot of songs. They banned my father's song, We're All Wounded at One Knee. One of the only songs. Uh, actually, I mean, there's a few people that have gotten banned, but his song, We're All Wounded and Wounded Knee, literally got banned in the U.S. by the federal government. But he hand-pressed it and took it to Europe against uh, Sony and CBS's wishes, because they didn't, they, or Epic, sorry, they didn't support it because it was too controversial. Because it got banned. And um, so he took it to, to Europe, and it went number one. He gave uh-huh. it to every DJ at every radio station. Look. He played it, and it went number one in Europe. If, if you... That's awesome, but that's also crazy that it wasn't just Sony saying we're not going to release this. The government said you cannot release this. That's yeah. nuts. Because they're talking about the slaughtering of Native Americans at Wounded Knee. You know, they have another song, Wovoka, as well, 
that also talks about um, injustices in it the It was just American more so community. about like during that time, the American Indian movement was very strong and they were, uh, they were um, organizing very, very- uh, It was too sensitive. Over abroad. No, no, they were basically causing trouble for, for, for not causing trouble, but they were causing trouble for the government by inciting their rights on their own you know, ancestral land. So in order to kind of suppress that, they had to suppress the music as well because they knew that they had access to way more people than like an American Indian movement. And they knew that my father also worked with them strongly to help, you know, community issues and stuff like that in the seventies. So just because of that connection is probably the reason why they got banned because they didn't want uh, and because of what it said, you know, yeah, that's, it, that's it, the message. Yeah. Is it were they worried of a revolution or an uprising or some type of social yeah. disruption? I mean, when it when are they not? You know what I mean? No, like when are they not? Yeah. Well, hey, when you when you, typically when you go to someone's land and you take it and kill everyone, people <laughs> tend to get kind of mad about that. Geez, imagine that, right? And and know. like definitely that's you know, I didn't learn about that when I grew up in school about what we did to the Native Americans when when our ancestors came to this country and you know they kind of allude to it but they didn't really it, it, it wasn't like a big deal in the books you know but when you start to do a little research we the government was not nice to the Native American population here and like what's what do you think like now in today's world you know you have all these um things going on in our society right now with, you know, Black Lives Matters and, um, you know, different movements happening. People are trying to be heard and, and get people to know, hey, we've, we got some problems here. We, we need to fix these problems. Like, what's the biggest issue in the Native American community that, like, your average, pardon me for saying that, your average white guy doesn't know about that we could know about and 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 help and be more aware of of what we can do to make the world better for the native american community what's the big issue uh, uh, first of all i would say uh, uh, acknowledging the fact that it really did happen mm -hmm. that, that's the that, biggest thing that, there's a laundry list of things yeah, yeah, but, there's so but, many things but, but but to not acknowledge it and, and to not speak of it and uh, try to hide it and keep it hid and and, and, and they need to they need to come out and and and, and say uh, hear, hear the truth and and feel it know that it's the truth it's not uh, it's, nobody's making it out it's not covered up with a western movie or a, mm -hmm. a ranger you know what I'm saying it's the truth being said uh, and, and they should accept it as the truth and or in, in check it out and see what you think I mean because. Like, like in Wounded Knee, we say, we were all wounded at Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. You say, we were all wounded by, by we were wounded by Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. In the name of manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. They made as many promises, but always broke their word. They pinned us in like buffalo and drove us like a herd. Mm -hmm. And finally, on the reservation, where we've gone for our preservation, we were all wiped out by the 7th Cavalry. You know, that's truth. It's, it's There's right. over 150 treaties that have been broken by the U.S. government, the Canadian government, and every, and every other government that's existed on the planet. They uh, are arresting our people on our own ancestral land for trying to protect their sacred sites from getting demolished for their own capital gain. There's uh, natives being killed at a higher rate per capita in every state in California than any other race in the entire world. And um, um, women in our community Missing being and murdered indigenous women. Raped um, and, and- Oil man camps yeah. that are you know taking over our reservations and mining our, our sacred lands and polluting our waters. There's, there's a lot. There's kids, in, <laughs> there's kids in cages. It's just like, it just- it, Somebody- it, so much stuff Somebody's gotta be paying attention. Somebody's gotta be listening and hearing this. The only thing that we can, that we can really do um, is try to use our voices and our platforms to amplify a message and try to organize and try it to is, mobilize our people. It's not violence that we, yeah. we, we seek. That yeah, we it's solutions. It. It's music, it's, it's through, through healing. Our, through yeah. healing, we wanna heal the world. We wanna, we'd rather see it healed and without yeah. uh, all the uh, anguish and the 
hardship in there. They always yeah. say, and like, the way we heal is know, through music. Yeah, the first thing it. they say is the first thing to healing is acknowledging. So, just like he said, going back to that, acknowledging it will give us a better way to move forward from it and to create better solutions and create uh, create better <clears throat> collaborations within communities, you know, like investing in the Native American community and schooling and, you know, better health care and, and things like that. They kind of just give give them land and say fend for yourself. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it doesn't just because you give them land and they govern themselves doesn't mean that they're the most prosperous lands. We, have, know, a lot, we, they, have, a, we have a lot to share, you know, yeah. we have a lot to, to, to acknowledge. Well, it was uh, I had a real honor of working with one of the smartest people I've ever worked with, which I worked with John Trudell on this documentary called We Hold the Rock, which is about them taking over Alcatraz in the 70s. And oh, I remember that. Yeah. 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 There was a person that, um, you know, he was a, a person who was extremely in your face because he felt like he had to be because people weren't listening. Yeah. Uh, he would also had to be extremely politically savvy because he knew that the government feared your people and what they were doing. And Alcatraz freaked him out, of course. Yeah. And then, uh, but to your point, I think Frankie, he was also a musician. So he also had that part of him that wanted to sing out about the troubles and heal at the same time as being, a, you know, a really forceful personality it was also a, you know a beautiful and calm personality as well. have you uh did you ever get a chance to listen to that album that john trudell did with uh, jesse Ed davis oh yeah oh yeah okay yeah so that um I i'm not sure if you guys are familiar but there's a documentary out that's called rumble the indians who rock oh, yeah yeah oh, cool so they, yeah they tell a great story about john trudell and jesse Ed davis and how um you know their stuff really influenced an entire generation to kind of like um step out of uh, the shadows and kind of, you know, have a political stance through music as opposed to my father, like my, my father and my uncle, they had a, definitely a political stance, but they gave it to you and served it in a way that was pleasing. More to digestible. Ears. Yeah, it was more digestible. But I mean, I, I, I love hanging out with John, but he having lunch with him was the scariest thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he would go, how long has it been since you've had your mother or uncle or grandfather murdered. It's like, I can go back one generation. It's like, you're from Europe. It's like, it's hundreds of years for you. And I'm like, yeah. my family got here in 1904. <laughs> and he said, you, if you're, you're, you killed somebody, you know? Yeah. Okay, can I just have my tuna sandwich? <laughs> That's hilarious. You ever meet Russell Means? I'm sorry? You ever meet Russell Means? No. no. Russell used to scare people to death when you, when you talk to him. You know, you know what it is? It's like everyone gets scared of the of, of, of those guys because they're just bombarding no, no. you with facts. Well, I grew, up with, that. I grew well, up with that. It's tons of stuff that they... They're just passionate. Yeah, but it's, it's, passionate. It, but it's all facts, though. You know? yeah. I, I, I think I kind of... I had a recent experience, and um, this is going to sound stupid at first, but it, it's kind of helping me understand the plight of people groups that I have different different uh, obstacles, you know, in, in their way. So my, I, I have a parking space where I live and they went and they fixed the sprinklers and right beside my car, which is a black car, brand new car, you know, nice. I'm really happy to drive it around LA and I'm like, yes, it's shiny and everything. Every day, the sprinkler sprays on my car <laughs> and only my car, Oh, and yeah. it puts hard water spots like millions of them. It's like someone spray painted my car with hard water. And so it can only be scraped off. It is absolutely a nuisance emotionally every day. <laughs> and and to talk about it, it makes me feel like, man, you're you're weak. You know, you're a weak person for caring about that. But it's every day. And I call the people and I'm like, please, I know it's not a big deal, but could you please come adjust these? It's costing me a lot of money. It's making my life really difficult. And But it just kind of made me think for a minute what it would be like to face way worse obstacles than that every single day when you go to do things yeah. and you go, to, you go to try to do business and you go to try to you know, just live your life and protect your family and protect the lands that you have. I mean, it's like, I can't even imagine how hard that must be. 
Well, true. and also when we did the We Are The Rock documentary, it was interesting to me where there were some, you know, gray haired old men in the Nixon administration who were extremely on the Native American side and trying to figure out ways, you know, do we give them Alcatraz? Do we, do we how do we work it out? And then of course the powers that be, the fearful powers always kind of overwhelm the people that are trying to help. And it's so easy uh, when you've got a uh, you know, community of people that are fighting for justice to, you know, to, to make them look like you should be scared of these people because they talk loud. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, and like I said, getting back to Trudell and, and everybody who was part of that, I can't imagine the political gymnastics they had to do just to even get to where they... Yeah, John was a good friend of mine. So we spent a lot of time together. And uh, and uh, he was a brave man. He was, uh, he was educated and brilliant when he spoke, a great spokesman in uh, and but he was real passionate and a loving, good man, mm-hmm. kind man. Yeah. I got the chance to actually sit down with his family um, a few years ago when I attended the Native American Music Awards. They they honored John Trudell with a lifetime achievement, mm-hmm. and uh, I got to sit down and speak with his family. Um, his I believe it was his daughter and his late wife. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, they, they they were really cool. We just sat down and had, had a drink and. You know, just traded stories because you know our people knew each other. Like my dad knew him very well. So, but yeah, man, rest in peace, John Trudell. Yeah, John Trudell was one of the great speakers too. You know, one of the great people. It's a good man. It's a good man. Well, um, what uh, are you? I know that, uh, PJ, you have a album that's coming out. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah. And, uh, also, also, I guess we should talk about that and how, you know, your influences have informed that record, PG. And then we can talk about, you know, uh, Pat, if, you, if you're still working on anything. But let's let your son have the floor for a second and talk about his project. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, no, I, everything's been going really well. Me and my pops have actually been in the studio for a while working on records. And um, I'm putting together an actual full-length album. Uh, and it's... It's going to be a wide variety of different sounds and different approaches to how I put together music. Um, I'm incorporating a, incorporating a lot of like more traditional sounds. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of stuff that I'm using um, from a spice pack that I'm actually putting together. It's a spice sample pack with all original native sounds that are going to be available at the beginning of January. Using a lot of original stuff like that to incorporate it to still have like a mainstream approach, but with the traditional undertone. You know what I mean? And, um, How do you, um, you know, that's an interesting because I mean, I, I love hybrids. I love rap rock and, you know, it's just how everything weaves together. But yeah. how do you keep, uh, you know, your indigenous influences and, and your Native American sounds? Is it difficult to figure out a way to commercialize something like that? I don't mean commercialize in a bad way. I just mean commercialize in a way that everybody listens to it and they go, oh, that's so awesome. Yeah, definitely. Especially because, like, you know, there's a lot of things that can't be used just because of, like, protocol purposes and, like, you know, certain sounds and certain songs carry more weight and are used for certain things that really just can't be used for commercial use. But the way that I feel like my generation uh, is approaching it is they're using what the, you know, elders have taught us and the traditional ways that we've been doing for thousands of years and they're flipping it and they're finding ways to incorporate it with a mainstream sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, my biggest thing are the drums. So, you know, natives, that's how we've been communicating and that's the heartbeat. And that represents so much for us from our day to day that um, my biggest way that I love to incorporate our traditional sounds is adding like just a real, real steady hand drum beat, something Mm -hmm. that represents the heartbeat, something that, you know, it's very, it's very recognizable by native people that they'll know right away, like when they hear it, they're like, oh, he has the heartbeat in his song. Okay, okay, I, I, I see what he's doing. And, um, you know, or or I've been incorporating a lot of chanting too as well. So um, I'll be sure to get you guys a copy of the uh, of the album so you guys can see how it is. I don't want to give up too many secrets, but yeah, it's going to, it's where, something that's going to change. change where do, what's, how does that like, this, and this is a, this question I just thought of, so hopefully it's not too off the, over the top, but like as far as cultural appropriation 
and you know people utilizing other cultures to, and creating music you know like is that a is that a concern or an issue like in the native american community like what what is is that d does that opinion vary greatly or is it uh what, what are your thoughts on that yeah it varies um there's a big big section and movement of people in the community that are striving to push the culture forward and really introduce the beauties that we have and the things that we have to offer into like mainstream music and mainstream media and tv and films and you know their whole purpose is to try to give us an identity in that world mm -hmm. and some people who are just um it's it's the majority of them are elders right and they're they've been stuck in their ways for so long they they are not really with capitalizing off of our culture our heritage um but for us we're not really in it to capitalize either it's just more about creating Great growth opportunities and, and growth spreading right? well yeah. yeah and um so when you look at it from that point of view the majority of the people will all agree that pushing the culture forward is more important so yeah we want a name in the game you as know? long as you don't as long as you're not using anything that's used for ceremonial purposes prayer songs mm -hmm. um you know, as long as you're not using any imagery or any type of stuff that's deemed unusable, then, you know, you'll pretty much get the support of your community. But um, every move that we try to do in, in, in music, um, I feel like we try to make sure and we're very, very careful of those things. So, Respectful. Yeah. So we don't we don't ever have to worry about that. And, well, you know. Pat, as someone who's been a songwriter since the, the 50s, probably maybe even earlier than that. Uh, how have you felt that your songwriting has evolved throughout the decades? From surf music to Native American. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, that's that's a hell of a ride there. <laughs> you should hear his new stuff, too. His new stuff is so great. Man. Well, my, my, my writing has grown along with the with program, with the group, with with the, with Red I, I, It seems it gets, it gets better and better and better because my mind's opening up and I... And I've always felt uh, uh, sort of uh, akin to uh, the spiritualness of it, you know. Mm -hmm. and I've always worked on 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 on, on the, the vibrations of the music, you know, the feeling that it brings to you here, you know, and 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 hear and make your hair stand up, and, and yeah, and that those kind of harmonics and those kind of notes that do that. That's that's what I've always been. Uh, after you know, I've been working with. So, like working on the music that you're working on now, uh, how would you say then that you know that that has evolved? Is that you're more open, or you're just more experienced, or a combination of everything? It's 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 uh, out there, okay. It's it's <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, you know you saw us taking off in the in the in the video into space and flying saucers and all, right? So we're coming from a place that's, I'm coming from a place that's definitely uh, not of this. Otherworldly. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very electronic-y sounding rock. But it's, it's beautiful. Um, it's nice, it's yeah. Got, it's got the feel and it's got magic to it. You know? So are, and are, are you going to put this out next year as well? or is yes, yes. Okay. Definitely. Yeah, he's still in the studio perfecting it. Yeah. And and coming up with a track list, but and uh, because, it's pretty close. And because my brother's not here, and see, I learned I learned to play the guitar like my brother did, did you know, with finger picking it like a keyboard. Mm -hmm. so that so I, I mean I'm playing the guitar and most of the stuff, and uh, bass and and uh, and uh, some rhythm guitar like Tony. I got Tony's rhythm, you know, the way Tony played with him. I knew what he was doing and how he was doing it, and yeah. so I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of adding these things, these ingredients in. And it sounded pretty, pretty real. Well, just to uh, get back to, to Lolly, for you know, I mean, a lot of guitarists, obviously Clapton being a classic example, used uh, Leslie's on their guitar. Yeah. Uh, but uh, your brother had, like you said, keyboard. I mean, your brother had an interesting way of not only doing the kachank kachank bits, but he would also do inversions that were kind of keyboard like. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, where the hell is this coming from? He's screaming here. He's more than one string, but like four strings at the same time. Sort of like keyboard, yeah. And, you know. 
Where do you, where do you think that came from? Because it's not really blues. It's not blues based playing. Where did he get his chops from? It's it's it's. Uh, I think we used to, when we were younger. Uh, when we first came to LA, we used to go sit in with Groove Holmes. You know who that is? No, no. Groove Holmes, keyboard of an organ player. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, we used to sit in with a lot of uh, black artists that, that played, you know, funk and blues and stuff. And uh, uh, it was sort of like, uh, he I played the guitar more like a keyboard. Because mm -hmm. he finger played four notes, uh, three notes and four notes at a time, you know. Was he influenced by someone in particular? West Montgomery. West Montgomery? Uh, I would say, West, I think, well, that was one of his favorite players was Wes. And uh, and uh, we used to listen to Wes a lot. So, yeah, I, I didn't get that until you just mentioned it. But he was so smooth and sexy. You know that is. Yeah. At the same time, being rocking, which is a hard thing to do, to be sexy and rocking simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. Lolly kind of developed a, 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 a rock funk with it. You know. What, it, Frank or um, Pat? Let me ask you this: uh, As far as you and Lolly playing together as brothers. You know, being in a band with your brother, you know, that's, I'm sure it has its ups and downs, you know, but what was the biggest like moment between the two of you where you're just like, you're both were just like, wow, is this even happening? Is this real? Did you, can, you, can you think of anything? Yeah, we were, we were at, uh, we were at Washington DC at the monument in front of 250,000 people, maybe even more than that. Mm -hmm. And 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 when we walked up to the mic and I said, uh, Aho, you know, it's an Indian way of saying hello. Yeah. Aho, and then you heard, wow. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> that was really a, a moment of, you know, Did it make you want to wet your pants? I mean, was it like one of those moments where you're just like, I don't know if I can do this. Oh, yeah. shit. So, but, but, so, so right away, the first thing I thought of, I got to get out of this. So I was like, <laughs> one, we hit, the, the, we hit the rhythm, you know. I yeah. didn't go one, two, one, two, three, no. <laughs> I would say, I would, uh, one thing was I would say, one, and right there would be right there. Uh, well, also, uh, as we... We, we kind of mar Matt and I kind of marveled at this in the green room about just how you know prolific the family is, and you three just never stop creating stuff. And I, I don't want to miss out on you know Frankie, you've got a book and a couple other things planned, so why don't you share that with the community? Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited. Um, I'm a writer, so I'm currently working on a children's book series that I'm really excited about. Um, it's a seven book series called the Imagination Series. And it basically introduces uh, spirituality in a universal way to kids um, without being aggressive. So it appeals to their imagination and in the feeling that anything is possible, anything you put your mind to. Um, so it, I'm really, really excited about that. That should be coming out uh, in 2021. And also tying in with that, I have a online retail store that will be opening up in December that follows along the same guidelines of wanting to put healing out into the world and awareness and and kind of creating a space for people to find the healing tools that they need to heal themselves so it's, it's all like a big thing you know he heals through music me through writing and you know giving the tools as like a conduit and and pj through music as well so those are a few things that i'm really excited about as well um, aside from the book with idw yeah. so we're, we're really excited about it well it must, it must be weird in a good way because i mean the country right now is in, in a mess. I mean, it's it's so divisive, and it's just you know everyone's so emotional and over the top, and and yet you know your culture has always been about healing, you know, and thinking seven generations forward and all that kind of stuff. And it just seems like um, you know we should just come to you guys and figure out you know how we're going to survive the next ten years. You know. Well, I read a book recently, and it said something to the effect of people, new ideas are just new people experiencing old ideas. Yep, I believe that 100%. You know, it, yeah. everything is a give and, give and get, you know, it's an exchange, give and, give and take, you know, it's an exchange. So that's what it is with music. You know, you get inspired by something and, and you create something else just by that in your mind. And the same thing with writing or, you know, it, it's all a cycle. 
like the infinity symbol, you know, it just keeps going and going. And, and we're proud to be able to use whatever talents that we have to incorporate that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's we're excited about a bunch of things coming and, out. And in reality, if we can be of any help to anyone, exactly, we're there for you. Exactly. Well, that, that is awesome because I think, you know, the, COVID has changed a lot of things in the music industry, obviously. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have That's lost right. their livelihoods, whether they're artists or truck drivers or lighting techs or whatever. Yeah. I think there's, we've kind of gone into a couple of camps where there's, I, I, and, and I get this, of course, you know, I have to feed my family. I got to figure out what I need to do. So it's voraciously commercial. Yeah. But what you're saying is like, you know, our main goal is not necessarily that. It's more about putting healing vibes out into the world and trying to help, which is an amazing position to take during this pandemic. That's, yeah. That's, that's what it should be. There's a lot of like, you know, horrible things happening right now, you know, and everyone's scared and, you know, going through depressions or worry. And, and I think that instead of adding on to that, we're all feeling those things, but instead of adding on to that, creating a way to uplift the people of the world, because everything around us, as you know, is created by thoughts and be cre created by what energy we put into things. That's how creation even exists. And if we want to create a better reality for ourselves, it has to start with how we're feeling inside, what we manifest, what we bring into this world. So that's what we're trying to focus on. And it's obviously hard because there's so much happening right now. But that's that's our goal, like you said, is to create that for people so they can do it for themselves. I you know? No, that that's great. And it's like, you know, I think for me, I'm going through a somewhat of a personal transformation where I'm not really worried about who's in charge of anything except for myself being in charge of me. Yep. And, and if I'm in charge of me and I'm managing my life, I'm managing my money. I'm, I'm managing the people in my life. Like if, if people are, are always negative and toxic and you're around them, even if you love them, it, it, it wears you out and it makes you ineffective so that you can't achieve your purpose, you know? So you, you just have to weed your garden. You've got to take care of your own life. And so many people, I think, and it seems more and more it's becoming people want to blame everyone else except themselves for their own life. Absolutely. And it's like, you know, your kids grow up, you make mistakes as a parent, you do dumb things. You know, if if you grow up and if my dad, you know, he he worked his butt off and he he brought in the money didn't play sports with me as much as I wanted to when I was a kid. So I ended up being a musician. He was good at sports. I was, you know, but I could be mad at him and be like, you know, I could have been a professional baseball player if you would have just played pitch and catch with me in the yard. And, but instead I was like, I'm going to be in charge of my life and I'm going to do what I want. And I'm going to take care of the people that I meet and the people that I'm surrounded by and, and love them and try to do the best I can. And I'm not to say political, there's nothing wrong with a good revolution and, and change is, is good. But don't forget that no one can take care of you better than yourself. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's so true. There's this quote that I love that says, you can't control your outer world, but you can control your inner one. And yeah. that, that to me is exactly everything that you're saying. You know, if you can control what goes on inside of you and what you do and what you bring to the world, but you can't control the outer circumstances. I think the man in the mirror. The yeah. best we can do right now is help the young understand the old. Mm -hmm. One is silver, the other gold. Uh, well, I like that. <laughs> As Matt knows, he's always he gives me crap for it. You know, I'm I'm a hippie. I grew up in San Francisco near the Haight Ashbury. Flowers in your hair, la la la. I'm, you know, I'm a rocker. I'm a, but, but like you know. Yes, you obviously have to take care of yourself, but I also love communities because I think that's what helps the world move a little better. It's not just what, I mean, you have to have a lot of, so I appreciate what your family's doing because mm -hmm. not only from your, you know, community of Native Americans, of course, but your personal, you know, family community of trying to get out there and do things to, you know, to change people and heal people um I, that's an a, amazing thing to 
to do. It's not just about, I got to have an album on the top 20 or I've got to have 50, 100,000 million YouTube views. I mean, right. uh, the fact that it's going deeper than commercial stuff. Because, I, I, you know, you obviously got to put food on the table, but I love the fact that that's not the number one concern. Yeah. Thank we, you. We, we've, got a, we've got a large family. We're just a three here living in L.A., but I've got a daughter that lives in uh, in uh, Beverly Hills, and, and her husband is Tony Gonzalez, who played for the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah. Oh, nice! Wide receiver, beautiful. I mean, beautiful receiver. And my other daughter lives in uh, in Las Vegas. It's a singer as well, and singing and in the casinos as well. So. Yeah, Kansas City. With me being born in San Francisco, Kansas City Chiefs is kind of a hard phrase for me to take at the moment. <laughs> 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 in the Super Bowl. Know, Isn't that in Kansas? No, wait. Okay. So <laughs> but, but you wind up with the Atlanta Braves. I mean, Atlanta Falcons. Falcons. And now he's living in LA. Yeah, so, they're working on that as well. But for, forgive me, but if, if you'll allow me a National Enquirer question here. Yeah. Um, uh, does it is it should sports teams not use Indian names? Is that something that bothers the young and the old, or is it a it's certainly with you know white people controlling these you know these teams? It seems to be a big deal, and I perhaps they should. But is that just you know white people being guilty, or is that something that really needs to happen? No, it's definitely something that needs to happen. Um, we've actually been advocating for the ban of usage of our symbols and our, you know, derogatory names as mascots towards Native Americans. Mm -hmm. We're not mascots, we're actual people, we're the first people. And if, you know, we're going to be um, used in a way, uh, it should, you know, to depict anything or anyone, it should be something of honor or something of respect, you know, so. Um, yeah. But um, right now, um, you know, it's a big time for change and uprising within our communities and changes are being made and, you know, big advancements are happening and names are getting changed. Um, but at the end of the day, I just think it's a respect issue. It's like we're the only people in the entire world that have our cultural items and our cultural possessions and our identities mocked and used as actual mascots, costumes for Halloween, um, you know, uh, like are just, it just, there's a laundry list of things that, that are contributing to a false narrative of who natives are. Right. Yeah. You know, that's interesting because like, if you had somebody dressed up like a Jewish rabbi walking down the streets on Halloween, everyone would be like, what is that? That's so inappropriate. Exactly. But for or Indian face or something, right? Indian or Native American. Um, and I apologize. Am I, am I allowed to use the word Indian? Is that okay? Indian is not a problem. Uh, native. We're using native now or indigenous. Um, Indian is something that was adopted by our people long ago. Um, it was adopted by Columbus, who thought he landed in India. I know, <laughs> but 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 it's something that as as people, my father's generation, that was the term that they used a lot. Yeah. But this seventh generation, the newer people, we're coming trying to up, switch it. We're trying to switch. Yes, we're, we're trying to switch that name. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it is awesome that change is happening. I mean, for a child of the 60s and going through the civil rights movement and going through the Indian movement in the 70s, the fact that, you know, the last few months has really seen movement on whether we should change these names of sports teams. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's disappointing that, well, and also, you know, just kind of the verb of people, you know, we got to change this. And it's like, well, why didn't you change it 50 years ago? Why didn't you change it? 20 years ago, why didn't you change it 10 years ago? You know, you, you get, the end result's gonna be good because hopefully, as, as you said, PJ, you know, you don't want your, your community mocked as a math guy. Totally, yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the next man, you know, we love sports. We wanna be a part of it. We, you know, we wanna have symbolism in sports. We have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, not a term that was literally used in the earlier days like red skin that was saying that like they that. would give you a bounty on red skin scalps and it, yeah. it, it comes from a real derogatory place there's yes. no way that anyone could justify that term you know true yeah. so and, yeah and it's and it's weird we don't i never considered the stereotypes that were being presented to me when i was a kid like the lone ranger and tonto 
yeah like his trusty sidekick you know it's like yeah, yeah. And, and it you know they kind of made tonto into the superhero savior of you know at times but at times he was just some just you know, yeah I, I don't know it was yeah it, it, it's weird and and you don't think about that until you actually talk to native americans and they're like yeah that's not cool bro and you're like <laughs> wow that isn't cool if why want, why did i accept that if you want to hear something even crazier about the story about the redskins football team the logo was actually created by a native um well wow. the name was so mm -hmm. um i believe that Things were done, deals were done, and art was licensed and purchased before they actually had a name. Or I don't know if the name was already in place, or I don't know who sanctioned it, or what happened. But that's like one of the natives that everyone looks at and is like, "What the hell are you thinking, bro?" Um, yeah. Or if you were gonna do that and make a like you said, like push the culture forward, do it in a way that no the way name the wasn't. There's Red no way skin, to push the culture you know? forward using that terminology. No, that's, no that's my point, is yeah. that if you were going to make the symbolism, make sure it wasn't attached to a name that hey, was... They should have called them the, uh, the Red Bones instead, right? <laughs> they, can use the name well, they, they should they should, they should have made you a partner in the team there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well... We're getting ready. We're at the top of the hour here too, and we've got to we've got to wrap up here. But I want to give everyone a chance uh, to have a last word, and uh, um, obviously, um, Pat, Frank, and PJ, really excited to have you guys here. And um, you know, uh, the issues that we're we're talking about are are really just healing in general. Anyway, I mean, all of it's healing, and music is good medicine. Music is is a great medicine to heal people. And, uh, you know, it's really, I'm, I'm going to dig into what you're talking about with the vibrations. Oh, yeah. It's, it's got me intrigued. Look into the, freak, the, 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 the love frequency, the frequency of love. Look into that. There's actually a frequency that sends off endorphins into your brain and gives you positive vibes. That so. cause we're working on a project right now that we mentioned to you off camera, um, that I think could actually learn something from what you're talking about there. You know, making people feel better. Music that makes people feel better. Yeah, we'd love we'd love to offer any insight. That if you we can be of any help, you let us know. Well, we we definitely will. Don't don't leave when I when I end the broadcast, and I'll just talk. I'll give you my contact info when we're done here. And you can follow our socials too. I'll give a shout out first because um, yeah. I have to run to the yeah do it. Uh, but thank you everybody for listening. It's PJ Vegas, my father Pat Vegas, and Frankie Vegas. You can check all my music out on Spotify or any other music platform under PJ Vegas. I have a new album dropping called Smoke at the end of the year. Check it out. Appreciate you. Yeah, and you I can hope. follow him at Pat Redbone Vegas on mm -hmm. Instagram and me, Miss Frankie Vegas, on Instagram. Also, if you're interested in finding out more about the online spiritual retail store, uh, the website is Who's Frankie, which will be launching in December. And you can also check out the Instagram at Who's Frankie Official. And, and also, can, the book is you can awesome. order the book on Amazon, right? Yeah, yes, it's you can order Red Bone, the true story of a Native American rock band, releasing with IDW Publishing. You can order it now, pre order on Amazon. Um, it's available, uh, or the IDW website, you can find it there as well. We're super excited and blessed to be working with IDW yes, on this and you know to get the story out there because it's going to be great for any generation. So, we're really excited. And, and Laura says October 27th is when the book's Perfect. coming out. October 27th, yeah. we're very excited for it. Yeah, and we're happy to be here with you guys and, and Kingdom and, of Rock. And thank you for, for this interview. It's been, it's been a real pleasure talking to you guys. Yeah. No, well, it was a, it was a it was a thrill. You know, I, I always love talking to, you know, like I said, you you blew my mind back in '74. You know, mm -hmm. it's nice to be able to talk to you uh, now, and you're healthy and still rocking and still making music. Yeah. How could it be any better than that? You know. God bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you, and uh, the best to you. Yeah, I mean, and I can honestly success. say, I love you guys. Love okay. you, too, brother. Thank you. Well, thanks for being on the show. And um, I did want to mention, um, we uh, I apologize. We've been not doing uh, meetups, but show guests, we are going to have a meetup on uh, Sunday at 1 p.m. No, 2 p.m. Pacific uh, for at least an hour. We'll see how if people show up and we have a good time, we might talk for longer. And we're going to start doing community meetups again uh, soon um, for all the listeners of Kingdom of Rock and Zoom. Uh, you guys 
you know, if people want to come meet the fans and stuff, they're welcome to do that. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll keep everyone posted about that. Uh, Mike, anything else coming up you can think of? Well, just, in, you know, this is this interview is going to go live now. And, and if you've watched it, enjoyed it and enjoyed it, please tell your friends about it. They should watch it because there's not just a lot of great musical history here, but also history of Native Americans and a lot that you should absorb about that whole culture. And uh, I learned some stuff. We've had, a, you know, also check out our Facebook page, Kingdom of Rock Podcast, mm -hmm. because we've got interviews with Steve Vai, Steve Stevens, Elliot Easton, Steve Luca. There, there is a wealth of information there uh, about people talking about making music and trying to heal the planet. So it's Absolutely. all there on it. And uh, hopefully it'll make you feel good. But definitely, definitely tell your friends about this episode because it rocks. Yeah, this is one of my favorite interviews. Oh, Seriously, it absolutely is. All right, cool. Kingdom of Rock out. Yeah.